Welcome back to the Andrew Tate Show by GSMC Sports. In the last segment, we were talking about last night's game between the Boston Celtics and the Indiana Pacers. We are moving on to segment two. As we do that, I would like to once again remind you that if you um, would like your comment or question recognized, and I can get the correct thing happening, you know, Barely had the right thing happening. <laughs> we would love to engage with you and your comments and questions. If you would like to leave a tip or a donation, you may do so at gsmcpodcast.net. That link is beside me. Again, it is gsmcpodcast.net. Moving on to the next topic. Let me let me just set up while we're chatting. Tate, would you like to <laughs> um, recap anything from the first segment as I get us set up for segment two? No, yeah, I mean, it's one of those things where, you know, as I said, they have to focus on cutting down the turnovers. That's the key right there. So, you know, once if, they, if they're able to do that, I could see this being a, being a much more competitive game, but not until that happens. So. All right. So moving on, um, inside the $2.7 billion House versus the NCAA settlement, uh, the NCAA and the Power Four conferences are on the brink of a monumental decision that could reshape the landscape of college sports forever. By tomorrow evening, they will vote on whether to settle House versus NCAA, a pivotal lawsuit challenging the NCAA's previous ban on student athlete compensation, which allegedly violated antitrust laws. This potential compensation, which allegedly violated antitrust laws, uh, this potential settlement, excuse me, marks the end of an era and the dawn of a new revenue sharing model that could send shockwaves throughout the industry. At the heart of the settlement is a hefty $2.7 billion in damages aimed at compensating Division I athletes who were unable to profit from their name, image, and likeness, NIL, between 2016 and 2021. The NCAA plans to cover $1.1 billion from its reserves, with the remaining $1.6 billion being raised by withholding revenue distributions to conferences and schools over the next decade. More significantly, the settlement introduces a transformative revenue sharing model. Schools could allocate up to $20 million annually directly to athletes, a move anticipated to become essential for staying competitive at the highest levels. This shift effectively dismantles the NCAA's traditional amateurism model, although it stops short of classifying athletes as official employees with federal labor protections. For the Power Four programs, diverting up to $20 million annually to athletes will necessitate significant budgetary adjustments, likely impacting resources and programs at smaller schools. This could further widen the gap between major football programs and smaller institutions, aligning with NCAA President Charlie Baker's vision of a top tier Division I division. The settlement also includes broader implications beyond the financial reparation. It could pave the way for resolving other high profile antitrust cases and potentially set a precedent <laughs> for future revenue sharing frameworks. However, many questions remain, particularly regarding the impact on non revenue sports and gender equity in compliance with Title IX. Ultimately, the decision to settle reflects the NCAA's strategic move to avoid the catastrophic financial consequences of losing at trial, which could amount to $20 billion in damages and potentially bankrupt the organization. As the landscape of college sports continues to evolve, the NCAA's willingness to adapt will play a crucial role in shaping its future and the future of student athletes across the country. So, Tate, first off, are you okay? Please don't die while we're here. <laughs> um, what do you think about this settlement, its implications? Give me your thoughts. Okay. The first thing is this was important. This needed to be done. Uh, in order, the most dangerous thing that could happen to college football is this thing goes to court and they lose and guess what most likely more than most likely it was pretty much a lead pipe lock that the ncaa was going to lose this and then when you start talking about the damages a settlement of 2.7 billion is is a small number compared to what it could be when you start talking about 
all the players that weren't able to get paid for pretty much the last hundred years of football, you know, uh, college football hid be, I mean, all of NT, I mean, all college sports have always hit around behind the whole amateur status, but the universities were consistently making money off of these, off of this, off these players. And so if a judge came in and ruled in favor of the players, how much is it to go back to, you know, the Reggie Bush era, uh, you know, the, the Dan Marino era, the Joe Montana era, going all the way back to, you know, Herschel Walker, Deion Sanders. You, you go back to all those guys that played college football and weren't allowed to make it money whatsoever they weren't paid they weren't allowed to make money and now it changes so this was the smart thing they had to figure out a way to settle this um you know when you're reading this sarah one of the things that it kind of made me start thinking is now this whole definition of amateurism is gone College foot I mean high school football are the are the amateurs. College football, they're not pros. With this settlement, they get paid. Uh some places they were already getting paid. Let's just, you know, a little a little bit under the table here, hence the whole Reggie Bush Heisman trophy and everything like that. But the whole concept of annual am amateurism is gone. It should have been gone decades ago, but now there are a lot of players out there over the years. I know there's a lot of people that may not agree with me that it does, that should have gone away years ago, but now there are kids who are, let's say, come from poor families, white, black, and everything in between, coming from the hood, the trailer park, the deep south the inner cities that their only their their only goal was I have to make it to the pros in order to help my family. Now there are now you can go to college, you can play college football, earn an income, may you know, that is earned, get money from name, image, and likeness, help your family and pull your family out of a situation that they were in. Also, another reason why I love this and why players I think should be paid is this. It improves the NFL. The NFL benefits from this. And the question you ask is, how does this benefit the NFL? Well, this is the way it, it, it improves the NFL. Every single year, there's a large group of players that turn pro, enter the NFL draft strictly because of one reason. They want to get paid. They may not be ready. There are, there are tons of players that go to the NFL. They're, they're not ready way before time because they know they can get paid. I have people that I have known who have made it to college football and they're like, you know what? I'm not ready, but I'm turning pro. I had a friend of mine, knew he wasn't gonna get drafted, but he was hoping to make a practice squad. Make a practice squad, not make the team. Make the practice squad, hoping to make money because he came from a poor family. Now, these guys who are here and playing college ball, they don't have to make that decision. They can be like, okay, I'm not ready for the NFL. I need another year or two. Let me get ready. I'm gonna stay. In, I'm gonna stay at Ohio State or Michigan, or Miami, or heck, the University of Akron or Kent State. They're gonna stay an extra year because they're they're making enough money that they can pay for their books and tuitions and 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 take somebody out on a date, maybe pay some bills. Now they can stay, get a little bit better and now be ready. The average NFL player lasts about, career is about two years. With this whole name, image, and likeness, that number is gonna go way up. 
it's not going to be two years anymore. It's going to be four to six years because all those players, a big majority of those players that turned pro way before their time can now take their time, hone, hone their skills while in the, at the collegiate level so that when they are pros, they're ready to be pros. You're going to see, I personally think, a big increase in the quality NFL football because of this. And that's why I think it benefits. There are going to be some universities that are going to struggle. And way to, and, way to steal my thunder. <laughs> that's my fault. Okay, question. go ahead. Go ahead. What, were you, no, what was no, your question? I was just, you mentioned, you know, you think it's a good thing for the NFL. So I was going to ask you how you think some of the smaller schools are going to. It's not necessarily sports. even the smaller schools. There are some major universities out there that are losing money. The one that comes to top of mind is UCLA. UCLA was uh, up until, you know, them going to the Big Ten. That's the reason why they went to the Big Ten. They were losing millions upon millions of dollars every single year. Uh, now they're going. They So they had to leave the Pac-12 to go to the Big Ten because that's where the money was at. A big part of why some of these schools in the ACC wants to leave the ACC and go uh, to the Big Ten or the SEC is because some of these universities, their athletic departments are losing money. Now, <clears throat> it's an interesting concept because now universities and schools that were barely making an income or barely turning a profit now have to add in, hey, if we want to compete, we need to set aside that $20 million to pay our players. That's the one thing where there are going to be some universities going to have to make a business decision. And they're going to say, hey, I don't know if we have that kind of money. Maybe we're going to fall back. I think there's going to be more schools that that fall in the the realm of the Vanderbilt and the Rutgers where they're going to make a business decision to not compete. There are going to be some other schools that are going to make that decision to compete. One of the schools I think about right off the top is SMU. SMU, uh, a lot of very wealthy alumni, a very wealthy school. They're going to be ready to make to pay players to help with a name, image, and likeness. Schools like that are going to make a turnaround and they're going to be, there's going to be a whole new, in my opinion, a whole new level of who are the true blue bloods of college football. The ones that can pay are going to rise to the top. The ones that cannot pay are going to fall to the bottom. I also think with this whole pay, per, uh, pay program that's going to be there, which is going to help a lot of the players, I think eventually it's going to split college football into the power fives that want to pay and the group of fives and the teams that are in the power five that can't play pay kind of breaking apart from each other. I could easily see that happening because there's going to be a competitive imbalance. You can't be a school like Georgia, Michigan, Ohio State, Texas, Oregon, where you're paying your players, you're getting name, image, and likeness out there. That's where everyone's going to want to go play in those schools. And then there's going to be a, a, a big drop-off in skill level where those players that aren't getting, that can't get go to those schools are going to go and play for free or for a lot less but there's gonna be a huge gap between those schools. Be prepared for that over the next five years. All right, so uh, we're gonna take another break. Uh, when we come back, we'll be moving on to, from college football to NFL, this time uh, Jim Harbaugh and the Chargers and their uh, office off-season training activities. We'll be looking into that a little bit. So stay tuned, you're watching the Andrew Tate Show by GSMC Sports and we will be right back. 